everyone. Welcome to Conversations with Catherine. I am thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to have with me today Christy Paul. She is a journalist, author, anchor at both CNN and HLN. And Christy, it is so great to see you because we've known each other for a number of years. Do we dare say how many and date ourselves? <laughs> um, well, I don't have a problem with it. <laughs> I was in Arizona. Um, let's see, we came here in 2003. And I was there mm -hmm. for five years. And it was such a joy to know you. And I, I miss the people in Arizona so much. It, it really was such a fantastic community. And I still have some dear, dear friends there that I just cherish. Well, I agree. It, it was such a, a beautiful time because I think we overlapped. You came, I was leaving to LA, and then I came back and you were leaving to CNN. But just a couple of times, yes. We yes, yes. We were able to connect. I was grateful for that. But I, I've always thought you were very special. I remember you reached out to me in LA asking for advice. And I thought, and, and it was funny because you prefaced it by saying, I don't know if you remember me. I thought, who can forget Christy Paul? Oh I my mean, God. please. <laughs> I'll, I'll slip you a 20 for that later. Thank you for saying so. <laughs> well, it's really, it's so good to see you. You haven't You're changed too. a bit. And I have so much that I want to talk to you about. Okay. First and, first and foremost, I want to congratulate you on the Voice of Women Award that you recently received this week from the Arizona Foundation for Women for your advocacy on behalf of missing children and for your efforts in creating violence, domestic violence awareness. I, I want to ask you, um, because obviously you weren't able to come back to Phoenix and, and receive that in person, which was a bummer, but um, everybody's going virtual, so I know it was a special, special meaningful um, award for you. But how meaningful is it when you receive something like this for these efforts that you are so incredibly passionate about? Um, well, to be honest with you, it, it means everything because I have three daughters. So if somebody looks at me and they think that I'm a voice of women, I laugh because I think my daughters are going to say otherwise. <laughs> I know that feeling. <laughs> I only listen to my mom this much. No, they're very good. But uh, I, I've I have cherished my friendships with women for so many years. I have listened to so many women's stories about struggle. Um, so if there's anything that I want to make sure I'm giving to this world, it's some sort of element that helps people understand their worth. And mm -hmm. if I do nothing else in my life, if I have done that for somebody, I feel like, okay, God, I did what you sent me here to do. Mm -hmm. You have done something pretty phenomenal in those lines, along those lines. You founded a nonprofit called Find Our Children. Uh, it's a partnership with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Through your efforts, you have been able to bring numerous children back to their homes. And I want to talk to you a little bit about where that need to make a difference comes from for you, because a lot of people don't realize how difficult it is for us as news people to report those stories day in and day out and not be affected by it, right? Right, and that's why I did it. Um, it, it was, it's a segment, it's really not a nonprofit, so to speak, but we do work with, the, um, with NCMEC in Washington. Uh, the sad thing is we haven't been able to do it as much in the last few years, but for the years that we did it, um, I was amazed at how we were able to find 35 kids just by putting them out there on television. Uh, I, I remember several times getting the call from NCMEC or um, an email saying, oh my gosh, you know, especially there were a couple where we, we would air the child's profile and the next day we would get a call that they were found or that they were turned in. Because the thing is, these kids, well, you know, as a mom, I, I don't know how I would function if, my child was not with me and I didn't know what was happening to them or where they were, especially in today's time when we know about sex trafficking and the kidnapping and that it's just so horrible. So we had done enough of those stories where I felt like we've got to figure a way to do this and make it productive. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we did. And mm -hmm. it was what was so intriguing to me was that people care. I mean, they really do care about these children. And we were getting, we found a couple of kids, we, I mean, we put it out there and then they got the call and they were in Mexico. Uh, there was another one in, 
I think it was, I think it, oh no, I can't remember where it was. But I mean, they, they were out of the country. And I thought, I don't know how what we're airing, I don't know how that's getting to them necessarily, you know, in Mexico, because even though we, we do know the power of, of social media, this was not as prevalent on social media at the time. Right. But, but there I is power in television, as we know. There's power in television, and there's power in people paying attention, and not mm -hmm. just paying attention, but then recognizing something and making that call. Because we can put it on television all day long, but unless somebody sees it and recognizes it and makes the call to get that kid home, it doesn't do any good. So it's real. I always consider it a partnership between who, what we're doing, what NCMEC is doing, and what the viewer is doing. Absolutely. It takes the power of all of us to make a difference. You know, I had a conversation with my 17-year-old son the other day um, because he, he said, you know, you're not like other parents. You, you always um, expect the worst. You always go to the worst possible situation when something happens. And I had to explain to him, you know, it's because of the 25 years I spent reporting the most horrific stories day in and day out. You have three daughters, as you mentioned. Does what you do affect how you parent like it does affect Absolutely. how I parent? My kids were not able to ride their bikes to the pool, which is down the street, take a right, take another right. I mean, we're in a neighborhood here. It's right there until this year. And my daughter's 16, my eldest is 16. Um, I, when, when they were little and we would go to the mall, I would assign one of them to pay attention to where we parked and it became a game and to get, get us back to the car when we were leaving. So they would remember, so they would get into the habit of, okay, we're on level two in section E and this is the staircase we have to come down because I'm trying to make them aware of their surroundings because we know that when people are aware of their surroundings, um, they're, they're more, they are, they remember more, things. They, they remember it. Not only if something happens to them, but they might remember, um, for instance, where security is, because I, I also always only park on the security level. Mm -hmm. So definitely I have had, it has affected me. I, I remember the worst, I, and I get asked this often, what my worst day on the air was. And no doubt it was Newtown. Um, I, I was on the air with Mike Galanos and he and I were going back and forth. Thank God there were two of us on the desk because I would literally break down and then he would take over and then he would t break down and I would take over. And it was just mm -hmm. four hours of that back and forth. And that day, my daughter who was in first grade um, was having this big Girl Scout troop meeting at the house for the Christmas party. And in the break, I had to call my husband and say, I'm not gonna make it home for this. And he said it was fine and he took care of it. But there was this moment where we were talking to a woman who was in the fire station with everybody else. And she said, there was a group of, there was a group of parents that they had sequestered in another room. And as that, as she was talking about that, we got an email and we couldn't say it right away because it, it was just one of those, we're reporting, but we're not going public with it yet because we right, have to. Right. The email said, so I can't say this without crying. The email said there's an entire kindergarten class that's unaccounted for. So when we heard that, when we saw that, and I'm listening to this woman, I will never forget looking at Mike and the two of us look, just looking at each other because we knew that's, that whole class is dead. And they're mm -hmm. taking those parents into that room to tell them. Mm -hmm. So my middle daughter, Sophie, is so good at saying, Mom, it's fine. Everything's going to be fine when I get a little too um, protective. And I recognize that I get protective. So I, I step myself back and I just say a little prayer because I know there's only so much I can control. I don't want them to live in a bubble. You know, I want them to be bold and strong and, and take risks and, and do what they love. And I don't want to hold them back from that. So it is a constant push and pull. 
and and sometimes you know there are moments when if something's going on in the news that's really hard mm-hmm. I know that they understand that they understand I am so that. right I'm so relieved to hear another mom speak like that because that's how I feel you know I had to say I don't know what it is but I worry about you unlike how I worried about your sister who's six years old or I said I I can't explain it I just I need to know where you are I need to make sure that you are safe and this is why I am the way I am I can't explain why other parents don't feel the way I do I just know that the reason I feel this way is because We have been privy to information that many people don't know about certain situations. And it is, it is scary. Or they just, you know, they're not inundated with it. I mean, the thing that my husband and I talk about is he can turn it off. He can just go, you know what? It's too much. I don't need to hear this right now. And, and we can't do that. Right. Because we have to be able to tell people what's going on. You have been um, also very candid about surviving domestic uh, violence. You wrote a book in 2012. It's called Love Isn't Supposed to Hurt, talking about your experience and how you survived and overcame the trauma of domestic abuse. Uh, I remember back in 2012, some of our mutual news friends introduced me to the book. And the reason they did is because I had just written a magazine column about my own experience with a, an abusive situation that I had just gotten out of the year before. So I think people were shocked when I wrote about it because of course I did my best to conceal it for pretty much the public. Um, what about you? What did it take for you to get to that point where you could write about it and talk about your experience and what kind of an impact has that had being able to be public about it on your personal growth and where you are today. Well, I just want to, first of all, say I'm sorry you ever went through it. I don't know how I didn't know that until this moment, but I'm, I'm sorry that you ever had to, to deal with that. I know it's, it's hard, as you know, it's hard to write about it because as you're write about it, writing about it, then you're admitting it. But I, I right. had admitted it to myself Um. I didn't start writing about it until I had my third daughter. And she, I mean, she literally was, she was born in September. I think I started writing in, I don't know, October or November. One night my husband was at hockey and I was home alone and all the kids were in bed. And I just had this overwhelming sense to write. And this is what came out. Um, And it came out primarily because for some reason, I was having conversations with women about this subject for it seemed random, but after a while, I realized it wasn't, you know what I mean? No coincidences. And I had been through some therapy that was so helpful to me. And when I would talk to these women about that therapy, you could see a light go on in their heads. And I thought, people should know this, because I know that what I went through, oh no, so this would have been, this would have been at least 12 years after mm-hmm. I had left that marriage. Um, but if I knew that if I had been where I, I if I had stayed, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I would have survived. I really don't. Um, and I'm, I I'm the same way. If you had done something to me or I would have done something to me. I'm just saying I, I could feel myself becoming a robot because you just don't want you don't want anybody to know because you feel so much shame that you've allowed yourself to be treated like this, even though that's not really what it is. It's not your fault. I always say when you give grace or you give people another chance or another chance or another chance, I mean, that is a gift you're giving them. But at some point you have to recognize this is not what I am meant to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not supposed to be somebody's emotional punching bag. Right. So I was having these conversations and my my therapy had helped me so, so much to recognize how a a situation like that can serve us. And it was hard therapy. I mean, I had to make these lists. And one of the lists was the benefits of verbal abuse. And I went, okay, this cannot be right. Um, Because you hear it and it's offensive. But Mm -hmm. my therapist was so good at saying, 
listen, it's not, when, when I say the benefits of verbal abuse, I'm not saying it's okay what happened to you, but I am saying it's not okay for you to let it wreck the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. So when you sit down and you think about that, I realized I had, um, it, it served me in the sense that I learned how to forgive um, in a different way, not just forgive him, but forgive myself. Mm -hmm. And Very really important. forgiveness doesn't mean um, that you can't cut them out of your life. You can forgive someone and you can still walk away from them. Mm -hmm. Because if you're in an unhealthy relationship, you have every right to walk away. And that was another thing that I learned. So I learned about forgiveness. I learned about independence. You know, I did a lot of things on my own and in that marriage, um, you know, just taking care of everyday life things because my ex at times would say, I can't deal with it or I'm just going to, you know, explode on them. So you're going to have to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned, you know, I, I think when I was young, I thought, well, if you're married, at least you're not alone. <laughs> and then you realize, well, I'd rather not be married. I'd mm -hmm. rather be single than be with the wrong person. Right. Because it really does feel like a prison. And I mm -hmm. knew that I couldn't bring children into that marriage. So I ended up with 60, it was over 60 answers to that benefits of verbal abuse. And oh, one, wow. And yeah, and that's all in the book. In fact, there's even in the back of the book, there's, I think, a 15 page um, exercise that mm -hmm. mirrors what I, what I did for myself um, with my therapist so people can do it themselves. And, and though it's hard work, once you realize how something served you, somehow it's so much easier to let go of it. Mm -hmm. It's so much easier to, to take it for what it was and see the good that it did for you and move on. And that's what I wanted to do. When I left, I really, I didn't have any, even anger at my ex. I just wanted out. I just wanted my right. own anger to breathe. Well, and it's interesting that you mention, um, you know, that sense of losing yourself in it, because I, I, I felt that way too, that I was becoming somebody else. And who is this person? And I remember um, I, I convinced him to go to therapy with me, um, you know, when he would show up. And when I finally went in after I had ended the relationship, she said, I have been waiting for you to walk in by yourself. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Yeah. Right? It was just, that's it was so cool. monumental. So. I'm really glad that you had the courage to do that. And I, I, it's funny cause I, I don't know if you feel this way, but I, it's not that I felt like it was courageous for me. I felt mm -hmm. like it was just necessary mm -hmm. because I knew that it was not going to be good if I stayed. So when people say that's so courageous, I don't see it for myself, but I look at you and I go, oh, that was so courageous. <laughs> I, I mean, I see it. You know how we don't see things in ourselves. Right, I, right. You know, I understand how brave you have to be to walk away from something like that, but, you know, especially if you're married. Because well, I'm going to tell you what the pivotal moment was for me. So my daughter is the one who sort of turned things around for me because I had been at a luncheon. I had heard a stat about the number of teenage girls who were experiencing domestic abuse. So I decided I would use this conversation to talk to her about, don't you ever let somebody lay a hand on you? She was 14 at the time, I think. And she said, oh, you mean like you? It was. Again, horrifying. another moment. Yeah. And I said, what do you mean? She said, everybody can see it but you. Oh my gosh. And, and I thought, what, what am I teaching her if I'm not willing to do for myself what I'm telling her to do for herself? So it was a very, very big moment. And oh, so, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I know, but, it, but it's, like I said, there are no coincidences, right? So, you know, that was, that was a big moment for us. What, what do you tell your daughters or what do you want them to learn from your experience as they become women? Well, they know that I wrote a book and that they aren't allowed to read it. <laughs> yeah. um, and it was funny because I just told them that I had been remarried and had gotten divorced. I probably about five years ago, I told my mm. two daughters, my, my youngest who's 10, doesn't know yet, but I had just said to my daughter, yes, my other daughter yesterday, I said, I think I have to tell Sadie. She's getting to that age where 
you know, she'll find something on social media and she'll go, mom, this says you're divorced and it says you're born in China. So we kind of <laughs> laugh it off. Because, right. Well, you know that I wasn't born in China and then we just kind of gloss over the rest. So I do have to have that conversation with, with her. Mm -hmm. um, and with the other two, I, I told them I want them to read the book so they understand what happened and, and what it feels like when you allow mm -hmm. somebody to treat you like that for too long. Um, the first time it happens, you always kind of go, okay, first time you apologize, I'm gonna trust you. Um, but we know that that, that doesn't yeah. help no. as you continue to live your days out. Mm -hmm. um, I want them to know that they don't need somebody else to be worthy. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I can, I can very honestly say that was my problem. I, when I started doing my therapy, I recognized, even when I left, right away when I left, I, I recognized that I had um, an issue with dependence. I wanted, I felt like I wasn't enough as I was. So I let somebody in my life who just did not deserve to be there. Certainly mm -hmm. not that long. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I'm, I'm hoping that they recognize their worth does not come from anybody else. And that's what I want. I want all women, I want all children to recognize that because I, I really believe that when we, we need to raise children who are strong enough to stand in their, on their own and be, understand their worthiness. And we need to raise young men strong and confident enough yes. to support those women. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting that you mentioned worthy because when I look back on it, it's almost like I, I have an out of body experience, you know, who was that person. Um, but I think it had a lot to do with the fact that I was in my forties and I had two kids and I thought, who's going to want, who's going to want me? Oh yeah. Um, this is, this is the best, this is the best there is for me. Um, so that was, that was really hard to look back on and realize that I was once that person. I, I leaned on my faith a lot. And I know faith is a very big part of your story and your journey. Um, as broken as I was, I knew that God had a plan for me. And I did meet the very best person and marry the very best person I've ever met. I love Kathy. As did you. <laughs> Yes, there there are there are second yes. chapters. I was sitting in third and fourth. Yeah. I do tell people don't think that you don't deserve a second chance. Mm -hmm. I, I really believe that no matter, and I think I'm living proof that no matter how off course you get from where you were maybe supposed to be, that if you just surrender it and you listen for all of those signs and you listen for all of all of the guidance, that you will get back onto the track that that God wants you to be on. And I, I feel like I'm living proof of that. I was in a church parking lot in my car in Phoenix, bawling my eyes out. It was, it was a horrible night before with my ex. And I had that, um, that Bible verse just popped into my head um, from, from Proverbs about uh, lean not on your own understanding. You know, trust in God with all your heart. Yep. And direct your ways. And that became my mantra. And I, I started inviting God into all my moments. And I think that helped me too, because whenever I would get scared, I did, I got scared with when I met, um, who is now my husband, Pete, um, it just felt too good to be true. And after <laughs> we've been through, you know, I had been through, I thought, okay, well, this isn't, this, <laughs> am I, find this? Am I, you know, I, I was very, um, very determined to stay focused and to stay real, you know, to make sure everything was authentic. And I would just, when I would get really scared and I do this with my kids too, when we talk about how afraid we are for them, I say, okay, God, I invite you into this moment with me, with my children, with my husband, whoever, because I recognize what I can control and what I can't. Right. It's tough. It's definitely tough. <sighs> So glad you're in such a happy place. Well, you too. I'm so happy. <laughs> Thank you. I told you this is going to be a great conversation, yeah. not a short one. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if people know this, but you sing. You have a lovely voice. 
And you were you did record two songs to coincide with the book, which folks can find on iTunes. One of them is called uh, Wake Up In It. It's a beautiful song. I watched the video last night and I thought, you know what? Faith Hill, Christy Paul, I mean, they could oh. be the same person. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know what? Listen, I, I can't say I agree with that, but I will take it to the bank. I receive it, as they say here in the South. I will receive that. I'll expect another 20 from you. Yeah, there you go. Yes, exactly. Christy, I want to let people know where they can find your book. Um, Love isn't supposed to hurt.com as well? Yes, yes. Uh, no, Amazon. We don't have a Love Amazon. isn't supposed to hurt, believe it or not. You I don't? am in the process of starting um, a website. So that will be up soon, I promise. Um, but yeah, it, Amazon is the, is the best place to find it. And I'm always so excited when somebody gets a hold of me and tells me about how I, I am amazed at how many people say that it really changed things for them and I hope so because that's truly the only reason I wrote it because I knew that I didn't ever want my girls to grow up and if they ever experienced something like that thinking that I wouldn't understand it mm -hmm. I want them mm -hmm. to know they can come to me particularly with this because I get it and I know what just like you you know what it feels like so hopefully there's a bond and a commonality in that that will keep bringing them home, so to speak. Well, you continue to change lives every single day by sharing your experiences and by doing what you do. People can catch you on CNN weekday, weekend mornings, I should say, and then HLN week during the week, yes. weekdays. Yes. yes. Thank you so much, Christy. It's been a pleasure reconnecting with you. I'm so excited about your award. One of many that you've already achieved and one of many I'm sure that are still to come. Oh, well, I don't know about that. I, I'm just really grateful um, for people like you who like to highlight good things and are just courteous, you know, gracious enough and have enough courage to let me come in and, and have a couple of words in that conversation Aww. as well. So it's all about the voice of women and, and we have yes. to remember you know, our voices are, are loud and they're strong and we need to, we need to raise those girls to use theirs and raise those yes. girls who will shout along with them. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate you immensely and thank you for taking the time and I will be watching you this weekend. I appreciate it. I appreciate yes. that. You keep me employed. <laughs> <laughs> and following you on Instagram. Thank you. Yes, I, I do love Instagram. I get a lot of inspiration. Uh, from people there. You know what? I think it's my favorite platform. Me too. I, I feel like there's more positive positivity and kindness there than on any other platform out there I right agree. now. I absolutely agree with that. It is my favorite. But thank you so you know, Catherine, the fact that you shared your story and uh I mean you don't understand the people's lives that you're you're changing and the courage that you give somebody else just from hearing what you went through as well. So thank you for sharing. Well, thank you for sharing, too, because I, I could say the same about you. And I know you know that because you've heard from the many people you've impacted by, by being honest about what you've gone through. And, and the bottom line is, that's what we need to be doing anyway, because we empower each other, encourage each other when we share. Nobody's perfect. Yeah, I told my girls, they know that there's no such thing as perfection. They know, you know, comparison is the thief of joy. Do mm -hmm. not get sucked into that. Um, and they know that they don't need anybody else to give them worth. You know, their value is, is fully intact already. And I just want, I you know, my dream is that everybody would know that because my gosh, how beautiful the relationships would be and the authenticity would be yes. people if we weren't too caught up in, in the rest of that. And listen, I, I still get that. I mean, I still have my insecurity moments. So there is no such thing as perfection. Uh, let's just remember that, but it just, we need to be there for each other. You know what I discovered about those insecure moments? What? There's a button on Instagram, it's called restrict. <laughs> and you don't have to unfollow somebody, but you don't have to see them every see day them. either. <laughs> you know what? And you have a right to do that. And I yes. tell people that all the time because they feel like, well, but I, you know, people want to be nice, but do I do this? I said, listen, one of the other things that I learned that was so, so important, and I tell my girls this all the time, is you've got to learn boundaries. Yep. You are gonna, there are going to be people that you're going to be forced to be with that you might not agree with or, or get along with. Um, but 
you just set up that emotional boundary around you and you learn to recognize who's safe for you and who's not. Mm -hmm. You'll be just fine. Yes. You have to be willing to be comfortable with what you're seeing. And if it doesn't make you comfortable, then don't look. Yeah. And you can, yeah, you don't have to look and you can walk away and you have everything. Yep. We have that power. <laughs> Good to see you, Christy. I look forward to reconnecting soon again. Love that. Thank you. We'll see you Bye-bye. Thanks so much for watching Conversations with Catherine. Please remember to hit the subscribe button, like, and comment while you're here. I'll see you next time.